Hello, you're watching Tell It Like It Is, and my name is Kathy Benick. Today's show is part of a four-part series of interviews called Race for the Governor's Council, in which you'll get to meet and hear the three Republicans and the one Democrat running to serve on the Executive Council representing District 4. Now, before this year, District 4 covered Manchester, Bedford, and nine other towns. But now under redistricting, District 4 covers Manchester, Bedford, and 18 other towns to represent one-fifth of the New Hampshire population, or approximately 247,000 people. Since 2003, our Governor's Council has been the amazing New Hampshire political legend, uh, Ray Wazurek. But earlier this year, Ray announced that he would not be seeking re-election. So essentially, the race is now wide open as to who will succeed him. The New Hampshire Governor's Council, or to use its official name, the State of New Hampshire Executive Council, is the only one like it in the United States. And it was actually the first council when it was formed 333 years ago by King Charles II of England. Its five members, along with the governor, has authority and responsibility over the administration of the affairs of the state, um, as defined in the state constitution, by state statutes, and through the advisory opinions of both the New Hampshire Supreme Court and the state's attorney general. Now, among some of the council duties are to approve each and every expenditure throughout state government, every budgetary transfer, and every contract with a worth of $10,000 or more. Thus, the council really does uh, or really must approve the spending of the lion's share of the state's $5.2 billion budget and ensure that no state department spends more than was authorized by the legislature nor spends money on any item or service not sanctioned by the legislature. The council approves the appointments of judges at every level of the judiciary, as well as appointing all commissioners, all notaries public, all justices of the peace, and all commissioners of deeds. The council must approve the receipt of monies from every direction, including approving the acceptance of federal funds. The council plays a major role in infrastructure improvement in our state um, by conducting hearings on the 10-year highway plan, making recommendations, and then providing management and other oversight of the 10-year plan. The council conducts pardon hearings for prisoners, something I never knew. It approves over 300 people each year to serve on state agencies, boards, and commissions. And something I found fascinating was the governor cannot veto the decisions of the governor's council. I was fortunate to have uh, about a one hour or longer conversation with Ray Rosarek, and my questions to the candidates will somewhat be based on some of what he related as major upcoming issues, hot button issues. Um, so my guest right now is Chris Pappas, who is the only Democratic candidate in the race. Um, which means that you will definitely be seeing more of him after September 11th as he barrels on toward the final. Chris was born and raised in Manchester, product of the Manchester school system, and then he went on to go to Harvard University, where he graduated in 2002 with a degree in government. He went on to make great use of that degree because he served two terms in the New Hampshire House of Representatives from 2002 to 2006. And while there, he served on the House Finance Committee, a committee that's intricately involved in the development of the state budget. He then went on to serve as the Hillsborough County Treasurer for two terms from 2006 to 2010. And he points to his investment decisions there as leading to almost $5 million being returned to the taxpayers of Hillsborough County. He's a well-known Manchester businessman since he's co-owner of the Puritan Backroom Restaurant and Banquet Facilities, which is a really a 95-year-old Manchester landmark. Very active in the community, uh, particularly through his service on the Board of Directors of the Southern New Hampshire Services and also on the Board of the Manchester Historic Association. Um, and this is worth noting. Uh, Chris's candidacy has received many, many union endorsements, including from the iron workers, the firefighters, both statewide and from Manchester, um, the New Hampshire Education Association, the Teamsters, and the State Employees Association. So, with no further ado, 
Chris Pappas. I am so pleased to Thank have you, you here, and congratulations on jumping into the race. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to voters in Bedford specifically. Uh, it's an important community. It's one of the largest communities in the district, mm -hmm. and so I'm going to be here a lot over the next few months before this election. Oh, well, that's great. That's great. Um, now, I will. I think I mentioned to you off camera. What I've tried to do really is to ask all of the candidates the same questions in the, in the spirit of fairness. Uh, so I'll do the same, but please feel free to jump in wherever you'd like sure. with any observations. Um, one of the big upcoming issues that will come before the Governor's Council is the state employee's health contract, a uh, cost in the vicinity of $500 million per year. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think, and you gave a very good overview and historic um, perspective on the Executive Council and its mm -hmm. role in state government. And just to kind of back up a little bit, I think that the Council plays such an instrumental role in all aspects of state government. It's really the intersection of so many different avenues uh, that are important to our state. Um, you know, from naming the folks that run the state departments uh, to the judiciary to making sure that uh, state contracts and federal monies are spent wisely. And so I think this is one area where the council must be intimately involved uh, to make sure that we get good return on our taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I tried to do as county treasurer and I made some smart investments that resulted in over $5 million being returned to taxpayers. Uh, as a small business owner, this is one of the reasons why I'm excited to run for the council and excited to serve uh, because I feel like my financial background and my business background allows me to pay extra close attention to the bottom line and understand the components uh, that go together uh, in forming a budget and in forming a contract. Uh, I sp did spend uh, several years in the legislature on the finance committee mm -hmm. um, and so got to know the players of state government and how state government works. And so I think with those varied uh, backgrounds and skills, I think I'm going to be able to bring those to bear rather significantly uh, on issues such as this one. Now, some people feel as though the employee contribution should be changed. Do you have any strong feelings on that, or are you kind of waiting to see how things play out a bit? I think I would like to see how it plays okay. out. Um, I think that's something that um, you know should be considered in the fullness of the debate. Mm -hmm. I think when you have tough, tough economic times, as we do now, I think you have to put um, everything on the table, mm -hmm. and you have to look at things completely and thoroughly. And that's one of the things I'll do as a counselor. Mm -hmm. Okay, true. Another big issue that has been before the council is the decision, as you know, to change Medicaid to a managed care system and uh, managed by private companies. And we have been told uh, that it's expected that 131,000 people will be signed up for Medicaid, which is about 10% of the population. Now, this is all supposed to start on 12-1 um, December of this year. But we're told that the whole computer operation involvement is a big issue. Have you been following this? Do you think we're going in the right direction with all this? Well, I think the train is leaving the station, certainly, on, mm -hmm. um, on the managed care program. Um, and the council has taken some votes that are putting us on track um, you know, to work with the three providers to make this happen. I think the computer issue is a significant one mm -hmm. um, because it has plagued uh, Health and Human Services for years. Um, and we haven't been able to get the system up and running to understand the data and understand the users of this program. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important that that happens uh, in a timely fashion so that the implementation of managed care isn't held up longer than it needs to be. Um, I do have some concerns uh, with the managed care and the way it's implemented. Um, I think there are folks that rely upon state services um, you know, for their health care. Mm -hmm. There are significant issues um, with the developmental disability community that I think we've got to make sure we listen to the stakeholders in this program going forward. And I think the council is right at the center of that debate. Um, this program is going to go forward, uh, managed care. It's a $2 trillion uh, set of contracts with three agencies. And um, I think it's important for the council to be right at the center of this, uh, but to make sure that the folks that receive the benefits and rely on these benefits, um, you know, aren't hurt by the implementation of this. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, privatization, of course, of state prisons is something that's now being looked at and obviously would affect the prisons in both Goffstown and, and Concord. And the council has gone ahead and signed a $171,000 contract um, for a consultant study on, on the whole subject. What are your thoughts on privatization? And I know that you're, you're in Man from Manchester, and of course Manchester is one of the uh, sites being bandied about as a possible location. Um, do you have any, any feelings on where a new prison might be located, best well, located? 
You know, I've heard a lot about this. Mm -hmm. um, I've done over a dozen house parties across the district, and a lot of people are very concerned um, with the privatization of our, our state correctional facilities. Mm -hmm. um, right now, it's just an issue that's being studied, mm -hmm. um, and the Executive Council has hired that um, consultant to look through the bids and to see if there's any merit going forward with this issue to, to push it to the next step. I really want to take a slow approach to this. Um, personally, I, I'm opposed to the privatization of our state prisons. Um, I think potentially um, we could be sacrificing public safety. We could be sacrificing uh, the health and well-beings of our communities um, to save a dollar in the short run, mm -hmm. um, but maybe incur even greater costs in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, there are serious questions that need to be asked about the public safety records of these corporations that are coming in and bidding on, on this project. Um, and I worry about the consequences of a town like Bedford or a city like Manchester mm -hmm. um, to be able to say and have um, a voice in the process to say where these facilities can mm -hmm. be located, um, what neighborhoods are sort of off limits. And the courts have said in the past that uh, localities can't pass these kinds of ordinances um, to restrict that. So I worry going forward that, that if we do uh, move ahead with privatizing, privatizing our prisons, um, that it will take away local control and that there are significant uh, public safety concerns that mm -hmm. need to be addressed. And obviously that's a real sticky, wicked issue um, because I think everybody would honestly admit that they probably wouldn't want a state prison in their own neighborhood. I think you're right. And, and there may be parts of the state where it does make sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there may be folks in the North Country that mm -hmm. uh, really do want more jobs and more, you know, investment in their Yeah, they supported the, the federal prison up there. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Um, but I think for certain areas, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, but even just taking a step back from that and looking at the business model uh, of these companies, uh, as a small business owner, I know that we do better when we get more customers coming through the doors. Um, these prisons, these private prisons, do well when they have repeat customers and they have people coming back uh, <laughs> for multiple tours of duty. Wonderful. <laughs> um, I think the goal of our prison system has got to be focus on reducing recidivism rates mm -hmm. and making sure that people don't reoffend and supporting programs that will um, ensure a smooth transition of our inmates uh, back into the general public and make sure that they have the tools that they can survive economically, make a life, and not reoffend. Um, I think that's got to be a focus, and I worry that these private companies might not put a premium on that. Now, there really are not any privately run prisons anywhere around this part of the country, are there? Or, I don't think? Uh, not in this part of the country, no. 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 I guess some of the southern states possibly, huh? That's right, and that's where mm -hmm. a lot of these companies are coming from. Oh, okay. Um, now, as you know, there are lots of people who'd like to see commuter rail extended into New Hampshire, even as far up as Concord. And I'm sure you know the Governor's Council rejected uh, federal grants of over $3 million that would have paid for some of the preliminary work leading up to possibly bringing commuter rail into New Hampshire. So the issue at the moment, at least, is, is moot, um, but I assume it'll be alive again. Um, what's your opinion on getting commuter rail extended into New Hampshire? And do you think that the council should have accepted those funds even though in reality, uh, they would have needed to match the funds with about, I guess, $910,000, as I understand it. Well, I think it's an important thing uh, to keep on the table. And I think it's a shame that the council took its short-sighted opinion and turned those funds away. Um, I think passenger rail has great potential for this region. This is a booming region, population growth uh, in towns like Bedford and Londonderry, which are in this district. And folks want alternative modes of transportation to be mm -hmm. able to commute to Boston and get to work um, and go out and enjoy uh, you know, life on the weekends too. I think this project could have um, potentially great economic impacts for this region. It could be significant to increase ridership for Manchester Airport to have customers coming up and passengers coming up from the Boston area to use that facility. Um, it could be a great thing for downtown Manchester and downtown Nashua mm -hmm. um, to be able to get folks uh, coming to those cities um, to enjoy the nightlife and uh, live and work in the downtowns. And I think that's why we saw the business communities of both Manchester and Nashua support this project mm -hmm. with the initial $100,000 raised privately um, to apply for these funds. I think that shows that this has potentially broad support and ha has potentially um, very significant economic impacts. I think when the council is more concerned with um, you know, denying funds 
go to um, provide critical health services for women, uh, but at the same time they're blocking money that could go to a significant economic project. I think those are the wrong priorities. And I think we've got to refocus the debate back on what we can do um, to give people the economic tools and to invest in our state so that we can succeed in the future. And I think rail has to be uh, on the table. And I think this, which would just have been a significant study of the issue, mm -hmm. um, and we hadn't done one in several years, um, was an important thing to do. And I think it was a short-sighted decision not to accept those funds. Now, of course, uh, critics are, are maybe not even critics, but just some folks who just say, OK, let's look at the whole thing. I think we all can say that, that it's it's a pretty good chance that a passenger rail won't be able to pay for itself, that there'll be some taxpayer subsidy involved, um, as it is, I guess, everywhere in the country. But do you think that those costs are amply offset by the benefits that come from passenger rail? Well, there are very few uh, public infrastructure projects and transportation projects that mm -hmm. pay for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, look at all the money we spend on our highways, mm -hmm. which I think you can argue are very smart investments uh, economically. They allow the transportation of mm -hmm. goods and services and people mm -hmm. around our state and are very important uh, in that regard. And so I think uh, you can't look at it in terms of you know, what we're getting back necessarily in mm -hmm. terms of funds, uh, because I think that isn't always the answer. I think you have to look at it in terms of what it adds to the economic mix, what it does to create jobs and spur economic growth. And so those are the questions that I think would have been addressed and could have been answered a little bit better had we had the tools to do it. And that mm -hmm. study would have been one of the tools that would have allowed us to make those uh, assumptions and make those judgments. And of course, truth be told, while at one time highways did pay for themselves, um, through gas taxes and the like, that obviously is no longer the case. Um, with more fuel efficient cars and such, the um, tax income, gas tax income, has decreased, I guess, nationwide. Mm -hmm. So that now highways also, from what I understand, have to be subsidized as well. So a big. Obviously, there's been a big shift in a lot of thinking through the past few That's years. That's right. And, and, you know, we have significant road projects and road needs here in this region. And mm -hmm. the council is very involved in transportation mm -hmm. contracts. Yes. Um, and we just saw the completion of the airport access road to Manchester Airport. Um, and there are other projects that are on the docket here for this region that are quite important, uh, projects with 293 and with 101. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to make sure that, um, you know, whatever we do going forward, that we can fund those critical road projects. Mm -hmm. um, and some think that rail uh, and even just studying rail might take away from uh, our highway projects and our needs there. I think that um, it can all be sort of in the mix and, and can all um, help us better develop the, the system of mass transportation that we need for a growing burgeoning region mm -hmm. uh, as the Manchester area is. And it's interesting that you brought up the highways and such because one of my next questions was um, obviously the governor's council does uh, play a huge role in determining the, sten the state's 10-year highway plan. Um, here in Bedford, our town council pushed very, very hard uh, for the 10-year highway plan to include the widening of Route 101. And um, they wanted it to be a high priority item, largely due to uh, Ray's efforts, I believe, that while it had originally been scheduled, the Bedford Route 101 expansion had originally been scheduled for 2019, um, it's now moved up to the 2016 schedule, at least now. Uh, now, obviously, there are people in other parts of New Hampshire who don't see Bedford's 101 little situation as being one of the major issues in transportation. So this this would kind of lead to my question, and, and and I do recognize it's a sticky wicket one, so I apologize. I, I'm not trying to be unfair. As a council member, do you think that as you have to make decisions, that it would be more important at representing this district to fight for a project within the district like the Bedford 101 widening? Or do you think that your duty more is to support projects with the, the most need and the biggest overall benefit, even if it happens to not be in your district? Well, I think you can find balance with that. But I think my first job as executive counselor for District 4 would be um, to make sure those priorities for our district are taken care of and our mm -hmm. needs are met. Okay. And I think that the needs of, of Bedford and the needs of 101 are very significant. And I'm happy to see that um, you know, the timetable has been accelerated somewhat on that. Mm -hmm. Though for people who sit in the traffic on 101 every night uh, mm -hmm. you know, and waste hours on end every week uh, sitting in that traffic, it's not a happy situation. It can't happen soon enough. 
Um, but you know, these are issues that come with growing pains and, and come with uh, increased population and communities. And I think that um, issues in Bedford and folks I talk to in places like Londonderry and Goffstown and Hooksett, um, which have similar problems and similar traffic uh, congestion, um, I need to make sure that I'm a voice um, for those constituents and the people in those towns and okay. speak up strongly for it. Um, while I do have you know, a great appreciation for the state and the needs of st the state as a whole, um, I've got to make sure that I highlight the needs of District 4 first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, as you know, there are a lot of people in the state, uh, probably along party lines, I don't know, who oppose uh, Obamacare and wanted the state to join in the lawsuit with the other states that have joined together to fight it being implemented in their states. Now, only the state's attorney general could do that, and here in New Hampshire, our attorney general was not interested in, in doing that. Now, his term is going to be expiring in 2013. Um, thus, the council will kind of get to decide whether he will be reappointed if he applies, or obviously if, if someone else will be appointed who the new governor will, will uh, nominate. So with that in mind, what kind of questions do you kind of have in your head right now that you would ask whomever it is that comes before you as the next potential attorney general? Sure, that's a great question. And I think the debate over um, you know, the Affordable Care Act and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the lawsuit that many in New Hampshire, especially uh, you know, the Tea Party members of the legislature, mm -hmm. wanted uh, our state attorney general to enter into. Um, and I'm glad he didn't because I think we would have wasted uh, tens of thousands of state money, dollars in state money, um, you know, joining that lawsuit really for no gain to New Hampshire in the end. Uh, there are other, other states carrying the water for that. I think there was no need for him to get involved in it. Um, but I think there's an issue on, in that debate over, um, you know, the supremacy of the legislature. And there are some in the legislature that think, uh, you know, the House of Representatives rules supreme over everything that happens <laughs> in state government. Oh, they think so. And I know uh, <laughs> by, you know, just some basic high school civics that that's not the case. Um, and I think that we need to make sure that we have co-equal branches of government, that we have a system of checks and balances. Uh, that's why I think the Executive Council is so important, because it's an important check, not just within the Executive Department, um, but also over, um, you know, the budgeting process and the mm -hmm. spending of money, too. Um, so I think that um, we've got to make sure we bring state government back into balance. I think we have had an extreme agenda that's been prevailing at the legislative level. Um, I'm very thankful that Governor Lynch has been there for the past two years um, to veto a lot of these bills that really, I think, don't represent the best of New Hampshire. And so going forward, that's really my uh, policy is I want to be able to work with both parties. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to be a part of a, a balanced, forward-thinking, uh, common-sense-minded government. Um, and I fear that um, the debate over the Affordable Care Act has highlighted the reason why um, folks in the legislature led by Bill O'Brien uh, don't have the right um, interests at heart. Um, I think for them, um, they think that the legislature is supreme and they are uh, very happy pushing their uh, far-right agenda. I think we've got to bring things back to the center and recognize that there are co-equal branches of government and um, folks that um, have great ideas in the executive branch and the legislature have to be able to work together going mm -hmm. forward. Uh, but on your specific question of um, you know, questions that we would ask the next nominee for Attorney General. And there's going to be a new governor uh, this year. Not sure who it's going to be yet. And there are, um, you know, candidates running great races on both sides of the aisle. Um, yes. Typically, yeah. typically what I would expect would be that the new governor would name a new Attorney General. Um, I'm not sure if, if Mr. Delaney is interested in serving again. I think he's served quite admirably and has done a, a pretty great job for our state. Um, but I think, as with any nominee, uh, you've got to make sure that they can check their ideology and their personal agenda at the mm -hmm. door. And I think that's what Mr. Delaney has done with this issue, and I would hope that um, that would be sort of my first request um, that, they, that they do going forward. I think he's got a tremendous uh, background in the Attorney General's office. I think looking at someone with experience in that office, experience in law enforcement, um, is critical. And I think it's such an important position that um, there needs to be a full airing and a full public hearing, um, and we've got to ask tough questions if need be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, as always, I get to the end of my kind of formal questions that I ask everybody, and I can tell that, that you're deeply immersed in this race and that you've also done a lot of research. What question did I not ask you? And I mean, I know I, there's loads of them I didn't ask. But what question did I not ask you that you feel should have been because it's a really important issue to you? 
Sure. Well, you know, this past June, June of 2011, uh, mm -hmm. the Executive Council took a very significant vote to uh, defund Planned Parenthood Health Centers in New Hampshire. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and they took away several millions of dollars in a state contract uh, that had been in place for over 40 years um, that went to critical health services for women and families. We're talking about uh, preventative care, annual exams, cancer screenings. Um, and this contract had come up annually and had never met, been met with much debate. Um, but when I speak about an extreme ideology taking root in Concord, I think it reared its ugly head over this issue. Uh, because on a three to two vote, the Executive Council voted to take the, that funding away, uh, critical health service funding from the Planned Parenthood Health Centers. And I think that was a really wrong-headed decision. I think it's really indefensible. Um, I think when you look at state government, protecting the health and well-being of our citizens has got to be paramount. And in that issue, I think they uh, missed the ball. They were too focused on their ideological agenda, uh, mm -hmm. on the abortion issue which, as we know, uh, Planned Parenthood's funds are completely segregated, and the public funds um, go to those very critical health services, non-controversial services that I spoke of. And I think the fact that for 30 years plus, uh, this contract had not been controversial, had not been debated, I think shows that there's a new direction in the Republican Party in our state that we've got to make sure we check in this election. Um, I really do want to bring our politics back to the center. And I think, uh, regardless of your opinion on the abortion issue, I think you've got to do what's right and what's best for your constituents. And I think taking away uh, funding for women and families that are relying on these services for their life, uh, for their well-being, I think is wrong, and it's something I would never do. Hmm. Okay. Glad I asked you if you had a sure. question because you obviously have a strong opinion on that. Well, as you can see, the time is running. And what I would like to do is that camera right there will be trained on you. And this is your opportunity to look right in the eyes of those people who are watching this show and tell them all about why that you deserve their vote. So go great. for it. Well, Kathy, thank you very much. And this was a great opportunity to be able to sit down and speak with you and talk about you talk about some of the critical issues in this campaign. And I think looking just beyond the issues, I think this election is very much about what kind of a state we are and what kind of a government we want going forward. Do we want the government where there's an extreme ideology uh, that's winning on every vote? Or we do, do we want a state government where we have folks that are elected from both political parties that can bring people together and work across the aisle? Um, I'm a very strong supporter of Governor Lynch. I think he's done an incredible job as governor uh, the past eight years. And I'm sorry that he won't be there after this election, but I think he's set an incredible standard for public service and for working together going forward. And that's um, you know, a template that I hope to, to work on and uh, a legacy that I hope to carry forward going forth. Uh, Ray Wazorek was a, a good public servant, and uh, he's actually one of my best customers at the Backroom Restaurant. We talk almost every evening. Uh, we joke a lot. Uh, we agree sometimes, uh, but that's what I think government should be about. It should be about people coming together, making the best solutions for their communities. Um, and that's got to be my focus going forward. It's serving the communities. It's making sure constituents um, have access to state government and get the answers they deserve. And it's about checking an ideology at the door. Um, so I'll always try to do the right thing for Bedford and the right thing for, the, for this district. And uh, I would appreciate your support. I hope you can check out my website. And please contact me if there's any issue I can help you with. And his website is www.pappas2012.com. And that and his phone number and other contact information will indeed be on the screen. Chris, thank you so much for coming. Thank Best you. of luck. I hope we'll see you after the primary. Thanks. I appreciate okay. it, Kathy. And uh, you're all watching Tell It Like It Is again, and thank you for watching. And um, I think you can agree that we have brought to you some super people who know how to tell it like it is, and Chris is one of them. So again, thanks for watching. You keep telling it like it is, and until next time, bye-bye.